I was desperate, you know, at the time I was 17, 18, unemployed, you know, and I was desperate to, you know, to get a break. And I knew that if I did get a try, I would, you know, I would grab the chance. I think it was always going to be boxing. I mean, I stepped into the gym as a 10 or 11 year old. Boxing just took hold of my heart straight away. I love everything about the sport of boxing. Hello, I'm Marie Crow, and this is We Become Heroes, the RT Sport podcast that explores how these athletes and sports people reach the top of their game and the lessons that they learned along the way. I'm delighted to say that my guest today is Gaelic football legend and AFLW star Cora Staunton. Cora, all the way in Australia, how's life down there? Yeah, uh, life is good. Um, yeah, finish the season, head home um, the end of next week. So yeah, looking forward to, to get, getting back home, um, but probably miss the the Sydney weather for sure but yeah um yeah good season overall for myself um personally but pr- yeah for, for the Giants itself was disappointing. How is that kind of uh balance of being over there and being a full-time athlete and then coming home to to life to regular life? Yeah I suppose yeah, it can be a little bit it can be a little bit hard I suppose but once you get home it's it probably takes a little while to to get back to normal, but then that becomes normal, and then coming back over to Australia is the hard thing again. So it's like a, a tug on heartstrings. You, you you kind of don't want to go home, and then when you go home, you don't want to come back. So yeah, you have them emotions on on both sides. But yeah, you just adapt. I think it's probably harder to adapt to coming over than it is going home, um, because yeah, life becomes very busy when you come home again. So. Um, yeah, it's the best best of both worlds. The way it's fallen that you have um, two summers. Um, if we if we get any good weather in Ireland, <laughs> I like it. Just chasing the sun, um, chasing the dream always as well, though, Cora. And like you're such a fascinating specimen because you're still able to perform at such a high level when you consider the longevity of your career, like the amount of years you've had gone, the injury, and then still been able to go. But do you think it's down to like genetics or is it hard work or is it the fact that you're doing professional football later in life? Like, what is it? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know. I don't know if it's down to genetics, possibly. Um, I think it's probably a bit, little bit of luck as well along the way. While I've had, you know, obviously big enough injuries, um, they've always been quite big. So whether it's been my ACL, broken leg, they've always been kind of the broken bone type of injuries. I've actually... Thankfully, never had any soft tissue injuries. I've never tore in a hamstring or a calf or any of them injuries that can be quite niggly. Um, so that that's probably helped. So it's probably a little bit of luck. Um, I I think it's probably how I look after myself as well. It's um, I probably don't really have an off season at any stage. It's it's you know I probably train you know twelve months of the year. Um, I think if I stopped at this stage at any stage, I, I'd be I'd be in trouble. So I think it's just down to all of that that I'm. I suppose from a young age, and I, I think it's probably going from Mayo to Carnac Hunt when I was younger, certainly at the age of kind of from 16 onwards, you know, our seasons because of the way club and county went was 12 years to our 12 months of the year. So I used to go from, you know, January to um, maybe um, September with Mayo and then you straight into Carnac Hunt and we'd normally get to the All-Ireland Series, which was um, November, December, and then back into Mayo training. So I suppose I've known nothing else. So I suppose, yeah, it's a little bit of luck and, I suppose, just um, constantly training as well. Yeah, that's what we said first. <laughs> so what about the the season, Cora, the extended season? Are we going to see less um, Gaelic footballers over there, do you think? Or is it going to be even more attractive because it's a bit longer? Yeah, it's 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 a, it's an interesting one and interesting times now. Obviously, in the next, um, you'll hear a lot in the next kind of two weeks, the, the sign and trade period and all that's starting to happen now because the grand final is over. So, yeah. Um, Word on the street is, yeah, you'll certainly hear more Gaelic footballers over here. Anyways, from what I've heard and, you know, from from, from clubs over here, they're, they're obviously looking for more Irish. So, um, you know, what, what I think there was 14 Irish girls this year. And um, the that past two years has, has obviously limited the girls being able to come over because of COVID and, and, and visas and, and trying to get into Australia. I think the numbers would have had increased. Um, yeah, so I certainly think the numbers will will certainly go up. Um, or over um, this season coming, which this season coming is it, it, it still um, only a couple of a couple of months ago with the change of the season. So yeah, I do think it, it will. Um, the biggest thing now, I suppose, is that um, in the in the next seasons to come, um, it's going to clash with the Gaelic football season. So a choice is now going to have to be made whether you want to, you know, be an intercounty footballer or a club footballer, or you want to be an AFLW player. So, which I think makes the choice, uh, you know, very difficult and. and 
I'm very thankful I'm at a stage now where I don't have to make any of them decisions or I never had to make them, but it will be difficult. And I, I think, you know, obviously Gaelic football will be probably a little bit lesser for the players that it's probably going to lose. Do you get calls from girls looking for advice? <laughs> <laughs> You might, yeah, you do. You get certainly get messages and, and, and calls, and and sometimes from maybe worried parents as well that are you know kids are or girls are a little bit younger because you know it's a, it's the other side of the world and it's it's a big commitment and you know I suppose if you're you know nineteen or twenty or even a little bit younger it's it's a it's a big a big life of in trying to move away from home so yeah you try and give out the best advice um you can and and each each bit of advice you could give out is individual um. You know, as I said, it was at the end of my career, and um, so it was very different for me. I was lucky when I came over here; I had family as well, so it, it's very different. But yeah, I suppose if, when you look at any of the Irish girls that have been over here, majority of them has been a success. There's been one or two that probably wasn't, um, and you know, I suppose they look at it as being, you know, it's it's a great lifestyle choice, and you know, they're aiming to have, I think, by 2026 to have AFLW fully professional. So if you can have a fully professional job as a sports person it's, it's very hard to turn down yeah it is uh, to be fair it's pretty cool we are expecting Vicky Wall to head down um, it hasn't been 100% confirmed yet but it's definitely been talked about quite a bit how do you think she'll get on we saw her at the, in the league finals and she was uh, loving life anyway yeah yeah I've obviously read it, uh, some of the the comments and, and controversy that's been surrounding Vicky, obviously there's huge pressure in her. I think, yeah, if she comes to AFL and, you know, there's huge talks here, certainly that there's um, down to two clubs that she, she'll be going to. Um, I think she'll do very well. Um, I think any of the Gaelic footballers that come out, as I said, 90% of them do very well. She's She'll certainly adapt to the game, I, I think, very quickly, I suppose. The biggest thing for Vicky is that, you know, me, they'll probably go on based, based on the league final um, last night, you know, me, they're probably going to go very far in the All-Ireland uh, series. And, you know, if they get to the All-Ireland final, I think it's the 31st of July that the All-Ireland final is this year. And I think AFLW um, season seven will start sometime at the to mid to late August. So she, she'll only have a couple of weeks to adapt to the game. So, you know, that will be difficult, but I, I'm sure she'll, she'll be a dab hand at this. Um, you know, as you know, there's, as I said, there's other girls that I've heard that are coming as well. And I'm sure they'll all They'll all do really well. As I said, the majority of Irish over here have, you know, done very well. And we see Orla, um, you know, obviously winning the Premiership last year and, and all Australian this year and Ailish winning the, the Premiership the weekend. So, and even the girls that, you know, haven't won, um, you know, Premierships, they're, they're, they really are at the top of their game in, within their own clubs. You mentioned the controversy there and, and look, Eamon Murray's comments have uh, garnered a lot of attention and look, it's you, you know, you can feel quite sympathetic for him because I'd say he knows, looking at his team, that there'll probably be a few in the next few years that are going to, to go and the season, look, it is going to get longer. There's definitely, as you said, hopefully it'll become fully professional in the near future and it's going to be so attractive. But what did you think about what he said? He said it's not good stuff to watch. He doesn't understand why people want to go and play it. Yeah, well, obviously everyone has their opinion, I suppose. Um, a lot of people will probably have their opinion. Um, mine would obviously be different now that I've been immersed in it for five years. Um, I always loved watching the men's game. And I suppose when you get involved in the women's game and you, and you see, you know, the intricacies of the game and, you know, it, it, it's it's pulled apart from, from Gaelic football. And I suppose people get annoyed when they say, oh, this, you know, it, it's they're very similar. They're, the games aren't similar at all. There's a skill or two that maybe are transferable to each game, but that's it. That's about it. So, like, I think it's a great game to watch. I watch so many games of AFL um, every week um, now that the men's season is on, and even when the women's um, season is on as well, you watch all the other games. So, um, now that I've been here and I have a great understanding of the game, yeah, it's a super game. Well, you know, Eamon has his own opinion. I suppose if he if he probably watched the game more regularly, had a, had a better understanding. You know, he, his comments might be different. It, it, it is different to Gaelic football. It's Gaelic football is a quicker game where the AFL is more of a stop start. It's more of a tactical game, a bit like NFL. But um, yeah, there's, there, there's, um, you know, I really enjoy it. And, and, and as I said, I really enjoy watching it. But yeah, I can understand why, why he's very disappointed because, you know, watching the league final last night, even though it was in the middle of the night over here, you can see that some of his girls are probably ready made for AFLW. And, you know, um, when you're a manager of, of an All Ireland winning team, you don't want to be losing any of your stars. And as I said, the seasons now are going to be um, running alongside each other. So girls are going to have to make a choice. And I suppose 
for him. He knows he's going to lose some of his stars. Could you see yourself going into to coaching of either sport, really, Gaelic football or the AFL? Because you're well versed, so well versed in both of them. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's probably yeah. I wouldn't mind doing either. Which which one will be the first? Um, you know, who knows? Um, yeah. Do I have probably enough insight into AFL? Um, enough yet? Probably not. Um, I you know I probably need to immerse myself in the game because I said it's it's a lot different to Gaelic football in 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 that it's very game plan based and um everyone has a different role and to know the role of each player is 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 quite intricate. You know, I I, I obviously can could you know, coach the forward line because I know, you know, enough about the forwards and how they operate. But if you're asking me to coach maybe uh, the midfield group or the wingers, you know, and stuff like that, that that's probably a little bit different. But yeah, it's it's certainly something I'd be interested in. And, and the same in Gaelic football at home, obviously, you know, right throughout my younger years, I've been doing coaching, whether it's school teams at home or underage at home or being involved in the Mayo minors going back, you know, going back a long time. Yeah. So, you know, I'm obviously passionate about it. Um, you know, which one I do end up doing, who knows, we'll see where the next couple of months brings me. But yeah, yeah, I'd be passionate. You know, even over here while I'm I'm not coaching, you're still doing a lot of mentoring and, you know, helping the younger girls in, in that kind of role. So I really enjoy that and having connections with, with girls and trying to help them go both on and off the field. So yeah, it'll be something that I'd be passionate about. I'm, I'm passionate about both sports now. Um, You know, probably... A little bit more passionate about AFL because I'm playing it at the moment. I haven't played football, but you know I'm sure um, when when I go home that'll probably change again. Is there many females involved in the AFL, men or women, just from a coaching point of view? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's it's no, it's it's very much like the men's Gaelic football at home. It's it's dominated by the men's, but yeah, there's a huge push at the moment. So. Um, in AFLW, so obviously there's 14 teams. There was was there any female coaches and head coaches this year? Not in the head coaches role. Um, Hawthorne, who are a new team coming in, um, this year have a female head coach. And she was a female head coach of Adelaide, but the first year they won the Premiership. St Kilda has had one in the past. Um, so they are they are becoming more prevalent, and there's a big big push on. There is there is females in uh, assistant coaching roles. A lot of females and. Um, um, they have programs over here where they um, try and get six or seven elite, um, you know, um, players involved in the coaching uh, sphere. We have one of them. Our, our captain is actually coaching in in our, in our men's um, team. She's um, our men's second team. She's an assistant coach. Daisy Pierce, who's a very big na- name over here, who played the grand final, is touted to to go on and coach. Um, in some sphere, she's she's been scouted by the Geelong men in assistant coach role. So there is, yeah, it's becoming more and more prevalent. Give it another five years, and I'd say probably half the coaches in in AFLW will be um, female, and there'll be certainly female coaches within the AFL sphere, um, because of um, the growth of AFLW. That's brilliant. I don't know if we could say the same though about ladies football and men's Gaelic football here. No, I I think they're they're far ahead. They have like specific programs each year that they're quite difficult to get on. I think they take, I think it's between six and eight females each year, um, and they're they're mentored by um, AFL um, men's coaches for for a year. So they follow follow a men's coach, and they obviously do a, a training program. I know Alicia, our own captain, went through it um, two years ago, and she was um, mentored by um, the Essendon head coach, and she also went off to America to. Yeah. For a uh, summer, uh, um, you know, see how coaching is done over there. It was, it was a sponsored um, a sponsorship that she won. So, you know, she's, as, as I said, she's now involved in our men's program and has been for the last number of years. Jeez, that's that's class. And they could definitely do, I think, here with doing something similar and just even the mentoring thing and, and just giving women opportunities to learn because we don't, there doesn't seem to be pathways here. And while we're getting a lot, um, a lot more, a lot better when it comes to equality, it just doesn't seem to be stretching into the coaching just yet but hopefully in the future anyway Cora let's talk about you and your career so can you recall your very first memory of sport yeah I I, I can recall my very first memory of sport of playing it would be de- definitely at home in, in, in the front garden and um, with my brothers and, and our, our neighbours we always used to have a kind of like a wouldn't say it was five a side because it could be a four side or a six side depending on who was around but yeah I used to get bed up in the front garden by my brothers. I have a brother that's younger than me. I have two brothers that's older than me. Um, yeah, so I was usually stuck in goal. And um, yeah, that's why I, I decided I need to learn how to play because 
if I didn't match it with the rest of them, um, I wouldn't be able to play. So, yeah, and then bringing it on into primary school. So that was my, you know, first kind of memory of, of playing sport. It was either soccer or Gaelic football. And yeah, primary school, to me, was a place, it was like a playground for sport. We were lucky with a, a principal that just loved, um, I was playing every sport from, um, you know, with the handball alley where we played a lot of handball, soccer, basketball, you know, volleyball. We played rounders, everything. He just encouraged us to play. And, you know, I was the only girl that used to used to play in the school. But yeah, he, he didn't treat me any differently to any of the boys. So who were your heroes then growing up? Oh, from a sporting point of view, I suppose from a female point of view, Sonia was obviously my, my big hero from a fe- just because solely she was the only one that was visible. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've seen her on TV and, and, you know, as I said, I was never interested in long distance running and I never will be. I was, <laughs> I, I'm sure it wasn't in that, but yeah, just watching her on TV. Um, she was obviously from a female point of view. I didn't really have anyone else from a female point of view from a, from a male point of view, you'd, you'd be, you'd be saddened here. I was a massive Man United fan. So, um, Roy Keane was, yeah, Roy Keane. I just wanted to be Roy Keane. Um, I just wanted to play for Manchester United. So any of that era, Roy Keane, um, the David Beckham, the Nevilles, that kind of era for, for Man United, certainly, yeah, I was just obsessed with Manchester United, loved them and everything that they did, Dennis Irwin. And then I suppose from, um, a Gaelic football, football point of view, um, Morris Fitzgerald was probably the one that I loved the most. Um, and from a Mayo point of view, it was Kira McDonald. But yeah, I just wanted to be Morris Fitzgerald for, for majority of the time. I remember after watching whether it was a, a Munster final or an All Ireland semi final, whatever it was, I was trying to do everything Morris did, you know, the outside of the boot from the sideline. I used to try and go out in the garden and, and try, try and do it. It never worked. But um, yeah, I just, yeah, I just adored him. I thought he was just an exceptional footballer. And yeah. So they were kind of Roy Keane, Sonia, and Mars Fitzgerald were probably the three that the three that I really wanted to be um, grown up. I love hearing stories like that, just because the impact you actually hear, because I can see it in your face, like the impact that one or two people can have on a young person and how they can inspire them to just want to be like them. And a lot of it then is just practice, practice, practice after that. Um, I'm going to make an assumption now. Were you good at soccer? Yeah, I wasn't bad, yeah. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be the most skillful now, but like I'd be, yeah, I'd be a Gaelic footballer playing soccer. Yeah, I, I obviously played a bit. I, yeah, I was w- with Ireland under sixteen um, for soccer, but I had to choose. Obviously, I was playing with Mayo, obviously at the time, um, Mayo senior. So yeah, it was a case of, of deciding whether I wanted to go play soccer or, or Gaelic football. And Gaelic football was always my f- first love. And then when we got a chance, we set up a couple of soccer teams, and yeah. I, I won two intermediate cups and we won the senior cup of Mayo as well. So, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't have said I was the best soccer player, but I wasn't a bad soccer player. Um, I think, yeah, just because I was strong and fit. And, yeah, we had a lot of just Gaelic football players that were just probably bullied every other soccer team <laughs> with our football strength. So, yeah, I yeah, I, I actually loved playing soccer. It was one sport that I never felt. There was huge pressure on you. You could just go out and relax. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it, it was a lovely sport. I, 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 still, I still follow it, even though... Manchester, um, many United are very hard to follow at the moment. So, um, um, yeah, but I, yeah, I love watching it, whether it's women's soccer, any type of soccer, I love watching it. Were you good at everything, all sports? <laughs> <laughs> be honest now. It's okay to be honest. No, it wasn't bad. Like most things, yeah. Like there's to be sports now, like the likes of golf. I, I've tried golf and I, I'm useless at that. I just don't have the patience for it. But, yeah, like growing up, I was like very, I was a very good handball player. That was the first All Ireland I ever was playing handball. Um, so I was, yeah, I was very good at that. But again, but that that's because it was beside us, handball and racquetball. We used to have a, a league in school where in primary school we played that. And yeah, I wasn't a bad basketballer. But yeah, there'd be certain sports that I probably wouldn't, you know, like the likes. As I said, I've only ever tried golf once or twice. But yeah, if I'm not good at it, good at something, I really don't have the patience to. I need to be good now. Um, yeah, most sports growing up, I yeah, I I think I was because I was small, I was quick and, and stuff like that. And obviously, had good hand eye coordination. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I, I I was all right, all right, and I was always competing against boys. So, um, I think when you're competing against boys, especially in, in Gaelic football or soccer or any sport, you have to be you have to be you have to be in some way better than them. So you have to be faster or stronger or whatever it might be to to beat them. And yeah, I always say like my Gaelic football skills were developed as a young person from playing playing with the boys for, for six or seven years. That's why they were so good. 
So when did you realize like at what stage in, in your in your life did you realize that you were you were talented at sports like that that you could potentially have a, a long career in it or, or reach the top? Yeah, I I don't know when I realized like I was I was playing so much sport. Um I probably realized obviously when I got called up to Mayo at, at, at you know 13 and a half to the senior team that oh yeah I must have been good. I, uh, I, I suppose I, I felt there was a lot of pressure on me from that kind of age onwards. And, um, you know, obviously went to the community games and we got to an All Ireland final there, and I was, I think, it was eleven at the time. So, yeah, it was probably around that age that. But I, I, I don't think I thought of it at eleven. Maybe when I was maybe thirteen. Maybe when I went into first year in school and I was on the junior and senior team and we won All Ireland, won a All Ireland with Ballon Rope and. Yeah, I, I, making the senior team. I was only first year on the team. I think it was probably around that stage, and and then obviously going into the Mayo team. And I think in my first match in the Mayo seniors, I I kicked two five in a, in a national league game. And I think it was from there. Then I think pressures. Not not that I felt it at the time, but I think from there on in, that's when people started to know you and pressure started to build. And you know, obviously, I was still playing on fourteen and sixteen minor with Mayo. And I think there was a year when I was. Um, I was yeah, I was I was probably fifteen. I was under sixteen a minor and, and with Mayo and, and in seven days I lost an under sixteen All Ireland, a minor All Ireland, and an All Ireland senior semi final with Mayo in, in the space of seven days. So I think yeah, I was probably around around that stage when I started to play with Mayo that I, I probably realized that, that I was talented. But at the same time, I think it probably takes you till till you get a lot of that older till maybe you're Maybe when you're 17 or 18, that you realise your talent. That time you're just playing as a as a free, like you're enjoying sport. You don't um, you don't think about all you're thinking about is when is my next game. And that that's it. I wish we had YouTube when you were 13, because I'd love to have seen. I'd love to be able to sit down and watch clips of you as a 13 year old just kicking points or uh, scoring goals or, or whatever it was. Like, describe to me what you were like at, at 13. Like, what was 13 year old Cora Staunton like physically, mentally, skill wise? Like, I want to know it all. Yeah, I suppose actually, yeah. Uh, the, the good thing is I've actually watched myself on, on uh, not on DVD, and it was for sure on. Um, <laughs> Uh, video recorder because um, uh, uh, Michelle McGing that plays with us, our club team McGing's her mom used to record all our games she used to video all our games so she's all our games from when we are in Mosney and you know that was community games and when we played with Karen O'Connor and played underage with Mayo so she she videoed every games and you know unfortunately when, when she, they lost their daughter Ashley and she, she stopped doing all that but I would have been you know 20th stage so yeah I've actually watched some of them back and she's actually converted a lot of them to DVD, so it's quite funny. Um, Size-wise, I was very small. Um, I didn't probably grow till I was probably about 15, as in I was tiny. I was Michelle McGing small, and she's still small. And I was quite um, I was quite thin as well. I, I hadn't put on any muscle or weight or anything like that. So, And I kind of short bobby hair that came to here. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was just very skillful, I think. I was quick, but like I wasn't su- like super, super quick. But I was just very skillful. And again, as I said, I, I attribute that to playing with the boys because you had to do everything quite fast. Um, and from oh, from a mental point of view, I think I was just enjoying playing sport. And I was just probably burned out from sport because I was playing so much. I was gone every evening of the week, whether I was playing Gaelic football, soccer, whatever it might be. But I was playing on a serious amount of teams as a 13-year-old, as I said, 14, 16 minor and senior with, with Mayo, the same with club. I was playing on two school teams. Um, and then I was playing, you know, um, other like other sports. I played basketball in school and soccer outside in school and outside of school. So I was just playing loads of football. And as I said, I was gone every evening training. And yeah, mentally, I, I, I probably never got really tired. Um, but yeah, I was just, I was probably carefree at that stage. But yeah, I do remember winning kind of like a couple of awards at that stage and, you know, you know, Mayo Sports Star of the Year awards and stuff. And even at that, I remember going to them awards, my parents not really knowing what was happening. So it was all about, um, I was very competitive now. I must say that I was very competitive. I always remember losing the All-Ireland to Mosney by a point. And yeah, I wasn't a happy camper. I think I, I wasn't happy with one of the changes our manager made at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I still think he, that lost was the All Ireland. So that's a, that's an eleven year old mindset at that stage. That's amazing, amazing. 
Uh, can you please get those clips put on a highlights reel and put it up on YouTube there so we can have a look at it. As we get older, Cora, we can look back at that. <laughs> Not a chance. No. <laughs> so, like, what was the reaction to being called into a Mayo team at so young from your parents? Yeah, it, it was mad. Um, I, yeah, see, my actual parents wouldn't have, like, not that they'd ever supported me. They just wouldn't have come to a lot of, um, like, being able to bring me to a lot of games and training just because I'm the youngest or second youngest of eight. Um, so, and all my siblings were very close in age. Like, my, my younger brother's 11 months younger than me. My older brother's 10 months older than me. So we're all very, we're all like steps and stairs, as they say. Um, so, yeah, like, my parents were trying to, you know, obviously fend for us and keep us afloat. Um, so a lot of the time I was lucky enough and, you know, obviously at the t- everyone knows Jimmy Corbett, he was our Carnico manager and, and Beatrice Casey. They were involved with Mayo at the time. So they used to bring me to, to a lot of my matches. Um, and, you know, obviously when my parents would come and support. So it was kind of, I was off with them and they just trusted that they were looking after me. So, um well, yeah, I, my, my mom in particular, like my, my mom was kind of the, my dad's the soft one, my mom was the hard one, but you could see, like, they, they'd never be one to give you massive praise and say, you know, well done, or, um, you know, they just, yeah, always kept you very level headed and grounded that you had to have your, whatever work that needed to be done in the house, whatever your job was, it was done before you went anywhere. Um, and they're very much like, yeah, you know, if they're at the game, they'd say well done or that type of thing. But I always remember my mom used to keep scrapbooks. And when I'd be in the paper, she used to buy the, the local papers, the three local papers every week. And yeah, she formed scrapbook beyond scrapbook. And yeah, you'd know it would be down under, under her bed in the room. So you knew from that point of view, they were massively proud. But, um, you know, they wouldn't, yeah, they'd never, um, they'd make sure you'd never have an ego anyways, that's for sure. And they'd keep you very humble and um, make sure like, yeah, whoever, you know, Jimmy and Beatrice or whoever brought me, whoever, you know, to where I got would always um, be thanked. And yeah, just made sure I was just, um, yeah, we, we, were, we were always taught to have manners and um, make sure that our, yeah, we certainly had no ego and, and just went out and, and enjoyed it. Were they worried about you going into a senior setup as a child? No, as I said, I probably think they just trusted Beatrice and Jimmy, wherever they were bringing me, um, we trusted them and I always remember as um, I think I was about 15, maybe 14 or 15 at the time, we um, the Mayo minor team had a trip to New York, again, organized by Beaches and Jimmy and a couple of the county board at the time. And they were bringing like f- like 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds off to New York for 10 days, which when you look at it now was mad. Yeah. Um, you know, and like even at that, my parents had no problem me going there because they were looking after me. So they just trusted the people, I suppose, that were surrounded by me. Um, no, so then going into a senior setup, no. They just obviously thought, oh, yeah, they, they think it's fine for, for her to do it. So, yeah, they let me do it. And, yeah, I, I I think half the time they probably didn't even know what match or what age group I was going to because, as I said, you know, one day I could have been at an, uh, an under-14 Mayo train and the next day I could have been at a senior train. So, yeah, they probably struggled to keep up, but I I know at the time, even with, with coaches with Mayo, um, we had um, um, Gerafini, who, who sadly has passed away. His sons played for, um, and Willie Joe were involved, Willie Joe Padden were involved in Mayo when I was probably around that 14, 15 age group. And, you know, my dad would have known Ger- Gerafini growing up for, um, you know, known him very well because he's a Ballon Tubber man. So I think, yeah, the people that are surrounded by me, they trusted them and, yeah, the, the scene I was happy and, and, you know, I was staying injury free and, yeah, the, the scene I was going about my business. So, yeah, no, they weren't stressed at all. It's it. They had another seven to worry about. So I was yeah. least to their worry. <laughs> you were taken care of. So what about, like, for you going in at that age? Like, were you looking around, looking, going like, these are women or were you grad? No, I, I, I think back in them days, it wasn't like, yeah, 13 was probably a little bit young, but like there was girls that were 16 and I'd have known some of them. I know a lot of the girls because they would have been on the school team in Ballon Road. So I wasn't like, oh my God, everyone's so much older than me. And now there was a few that I was definitely afraid of because I was, again, I was very slight. So I was thinking, oh, well, if they come near me, I'm I'm dead. Um, but no, I just kind of, I suppose the first match, maybe the first league match, nearly sure it was against Monaghan. Um, yeah, I just think, yeah, kind of, you just knew your speed and your agility. And um, yeah, I, I just think, no, there was no fear. I, I had been playing with, with Karen O'Connor in, in, in a junior setup. We weren't a senior team at the time. And I'd already been playing against um, 
women that were a lot older and stronger than me at the time. I think that was more scarier because it was at a club level. I was a little bit younger. Um, no, so I wasn't really phased by it because I knew a lot of the girls that were in there already, as I said, from, from school. Um, you know, the Heffernan sisters, even though they were older. Um, um, there was Joyce O'Hara. There was a number of other people. Denise Horan. They all kind of just looked after me. And yeah. And eventually then the likes of Michelle McGinn came in. and She was she was the same age as me. So, no, I didn't really take any notice, I think. I just got on with it. And, yeah, I suppose, you know, once you're kind of playing and, yeah, I, I don't think you really looked at who, who was beside you or what age they were. Yeah, and I, I suppose, look, now when we're talking about it, like it would be front page of every paper if it happened. But back then it was a little bit uh, normal. I had or- Ursula on there recently and, and, you know, she was 14. And, you know, we were talking about Veronica Curtin that time when the Odd Ireland when she was about 15. So, you know, it, it, it did happen a little bit back then. It wasn't normal, but it, there was a little bit more of it. Whereas now, like, it just wouldn't happen. Yeah, I think I I'm, I'm not sure. I think it was Neve Killen was probably 15 when she was in an All Ireland woman and are very close to that age. So yeah, it wasn't like oh, it wasn't like oh my God, she's so young. Where if you've seen a 13 year old, <laughs> my 13 year old niece continue now playing with senior team, you'd be kind of like. But at, at, at the same time, it's in a in a in an inter county setup. It's 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 huge, but it's. At a club set up, we used to have girls that are quite young coming in and playing senior club football with us, probably not at 13, but not far off, yeah, kind of yeah. the 50. Group, so, yeah, no, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a lot different. I think sometimes people compare it to men's teams where it's completely different. Yeah, and, and girls develop at all different ages and, you know, you see them in different sizes and all the rest. So, like, it, it can be. And especially, I think, in clubs, when you, the numbers are so small, you sometimes just you need the players and it's simple as that. So when you were growing up and you were playing football, was there anything that you worked on really hard as a player or practiced all the time? Yeah, um, I suppose. Um, and it was a Carnicon thing again. Um, we were drilled, drilled into us that we'd be able to left and right for solo, hand pass, kick pass it was drilled into us. Um, so, yeah, I always just remember like whenever we were at training, Jimmy just making us left, right all the time. Um, and that was all... At that stage back then, it was all skills based. It wasn't, you know, to me as a young person, it was never, we never done fitness training that I remember um, as a 12, 13, 14 year old. We never done fitness training. It was just all skills based. And it was, it was just home in the evening from school and you were just out kicking the ball against the wall or out in the garden um, trying to, you know, whatever it might be, kick the ball up in the roof and trying to climb, catch it. Yeah, it was all, to me, it was all skills. I just loved getting better at the skills and then you know obviously becoming good at taking freeze or whatever whatever it might be so yeah that's all I ever wanted to do was like shoot and just yeah be good at the skill yeah fitness big thing at all comparing to you know as as you went on in later years but and it's the thing I think yeah and I think that's probably half the reason Karen Quinn were very successful is because um, all our all our girls were so skillful, and that's just training became the normal, and that passed on to the next age group, and that passed on to the next age group, and I think that was probably one of the secrets to, to our success was that was drilled into us from when we were probably ten or eleven years of age. Yeah, and like I find now that that seems to be gone out of it a lot with kids and training. There isn't as much focus on skills, and then by the time there nearly is focus on it, it's it's nearly a bit too late. Like. Yeah, well, like that's the biggest thing as a as a as a young person. Um, that's all you should be developing. You know, whatever age you pick, pick up a football, if it's six or seven, right up to you know probably till you're at least you're in primary school or out of primary school. That's all you should be ever focusing on. That should should they all should ever do a training is just skills and and play games and you know coordination and stuff and you know hop and jump or whatever it might be. It shouldn't be anything else. Um, in, in my opinion, I think it's that's the most basic thing because. If you're, and obviously I know coming to a different sport in later years, trying to pick up a sport that's unnatural to you and you're trying to pick up the skills. It's a lot harder to develop skills in your in your later years than it is when you're, you know, a six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old. Um, it's, it's, so that's where it all, that's where you see even in hurling or any of the sports, the really top players in, in the Gooches or the Henrys in Hurlands, you know, it's their skills that, that stands them out from the crowd. You know, Gooch wasn't the biggest a guy, you know, he wasn't the quickest guy, but he was the most skillful uh, player that's probably ever played the game, and that's what stood him out from the from the rest. And if you ever talk to him, it's 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 down to that he just practices skills all the time, and he was down on the pitch practicing them, and 
I think it's it's a great lesson for young people that you don't need to be the strongest or you don't need to be the fastest, but you can practice your skills and be the, the most skillful player out there. Yeah, that's really good advice. So was there a moment, Cora, when you thought, right, I've made it here. I'm at the top. Like, I'm uh, I'm the elite here. <laughs> no, for sure not. Never been. Um, no, I think you're always striving for more. Um, and that's been honest. Like, even out here, you're always striving to be better, even if you if you're you think you're you're winning a best and fairest or you're you're winning a premiership or at home if you win the All Ireland Mayo or Carnegie Gun. Yeah, it's just it's the next thing. Unfortunately, you know, things just roll into the next year, like season rolls into the next season. Yeah, you're probably satisfied for, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a couple of hours or a couple of days after it, but then that satisfaction has been gone and you're just wanting more. So if you've won one All Ireland, you want two. If you won three, you won four. If you won one county title, you want another. And and it's always just on to the next. And yeah, I think you're you're probably never satisfied. So yeah, even yeah, I I I don't think you can ever um say that you've made it. Um, I, I, there's always improvements. Um, there's no game where you're like, oh, that was the best game I've ever played, and I couldn't have done anything better. Um, no, you're always striving to make yourself better, whether that's on or on or off the pitch. So yeah, no, I still don't think I've made it. So yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> Wouldn't be ever have, to be honest. I think that's your mentality as well, though. You know, you're like always pushing for more um, all the time. So what was the biggest setback then that you had to overcome? Uh, there's probably been a few in life, I suppose. For me, there's probably been two, like obviously losing my mom when I was young. So I lost my mom when I was 16. Um, th- that was probably obviously a big setback. And it was only recently I was doing a talk over here for a GA club that you, you kind of remember these things. And I, I probably didn't realize that was a setback till I was probably, till I wrote my book. And that was probably 20 years after I lost mom. So yeah, that was obviously a huge setback. And that was more so from a, from the mental point of view. Obviously, early days, didn't want to go back and play a sport, fell out of love with it. But I suppose even right throughout your your career that you're playing, uh, especially the early days and the years after, um, that that you lose or that you're you just don't realize that you're probably not in in a, in a really good headspace, um and yeah you you're when you're not in a really good headspace me in particular and I'm not fully prepared I don't think you play your best football so yeah from, from that point of view from person point of view that was probably the biggest setback and I suppose injury then is the other one that is is a setback that you'll have um you know I've done a few injuries obviously my leg break has been well documented over here in later days. You know, I tore my ACL in, in, in 2003, um, but, you know, being, being stubborn who I am and, you know, decided that I didn't need to get it, get it operated on and you know, didn't get it operated on until 2008. So, you know, played five years with a torn ACL. So, yeah, I spent years in the gym trying to just build up my, my quads and my hamstrings. So, yeah, there are setbacks, but I think any setback that you have just makes you stronger. Um, you know, I, whether it's in, in personal life or if it's in, in sport or injury, I think, any of the setbacks that I've had um, you know, has definitely made you more mentally resilient and, and makes you, I think, makes you appreciate things a little bit more. But also, yeah, it certainly makes you stronger and, and mentally tougher. So there's when things are thrown at you, you're, you're probably nearly ready, for, you're able for anything. And there's not too many things that will floor you. Who the biggest impact on your career then? Oh, God, that's, oh, that's a very hard one to answer. Um, I'd always say, like, my mother has had a huge impact on her career, even even when she hasn't been alive in in her what, 16 years that she was, in my case, alive. She's had a huge impact. And it was an impact from the point of view that um, she, my mom had cancer from probably the, when I was the age of 13 to 16. So she she did quite a hard cancer battle, but always put on like a very brave face and was always, always, always worried about minding us. And I suppose as uh, being one of the younger kids, you're protected. A little bit from it, and you don't really hear as much. But like I, I, I spent most of my transition years home before my mother um, passed away, and you know I would have seen a lot of her battles. But like she was always a fighter; she wasn't one to lie down and say, "No, you know, I'm going to let this." She'd always get up and, and get on with it, even though she wasn't fit to get on with it. So I think, and I probably didn't again realize this till her further on in years that yeah, her in her cancer battle and. and the way that she was as a person, you know, she was, as I said, she was very hard and she was very strong and she, yeah, she was a woman that you would certainly wouldn't cross. Um, but I think that probably came out, that's probably in me, but, you know, you only kind of realize that further down the years. So, 
yeah, I, I suppose from a point of view, she's definitely probably the one person that's inspired me. And then it's, you know, probably a couple of coaches that you have along the way. Um, obviously, Jimmy was a huge um, part of my career coaching was that he was my coach for 20 years. And I suppose the coach that I have here in, in Australia now, um, Al as well, he's been a huge inspiration for me over the last five years. And, you know, someone that I've you know built a brilliant relationship and someone that I've learned a lot from. So, yeah, they're the type of people that, you know, kind of inspire me. And and, and I, I suppose then you have friends along the way. You know, I've uh, particularly a best friend in in. Yvonne Byrne, you know, crazy. She was Mayo goalkeeper and Mayo centre back for years. You know, she's probably another person that I look at, and yeah, she's inspired me and, and helped me along my career. Um, and that's probably since I was been sixteen. She's, you know, she's certainly helped me when when things are being tough. When you when you think of all the performances that you had, Cora, and the big games that you you played, is there one performance that defines you that you think, right, when I was playing out in the front garden, this is the kind of player that I wanted to be? <laughs> oh, well, um, <laughs> I, I, there's probably been, been been lots of performances, but like, I, I yeah, I, I probably think it's probably came they've probably came more in the Carnacon jersey um, you know in, in a couple of all Ireland finals or in really big games for Carnacon. Um, you know, because obviously, you know, there's huge pressure on you when you're a Mayo because you know who you are, there's probably even bigger pressure on you when you're playing for Carnacon. But yeah, there's been been probably a couple of all Ireland finals that I've played in um for Carnacon that yeah, you've you've looked back on and gone, yeah, Jesus, that was that was a good performance. But do you know, I think you've played in in so many big matches. Uh, honestly, I I do forget the match and and you move on to the, move on to the next one. But yeah, there's there's been a couple of matches where we've been very lucky and we've got over the line. I actually particularly remember a Connacht final, um, in Clogher, you know, which is our home ground in Carnegie. We were playing Curfin, and they were our rivals for years. And I remember, and, and we were down by two points in in that, and I think it was a minute to go and. I remember we we literally our goalkeeper kicked out the ball and it was won by our, our Carly McGing, our wing back at the time and she kicked it to Fiona and Fiona kicked the ball into me and yeah I scored this outrageous goal and I'd say the next kick out was um it was game over it was a game we should have lost but it was a game that just I think um, epitomised what we are as a team and that was I think that was probably around two thousand and. I think it was probably around 2011 and we went on and won the All-Ireland that year. So, yeah, there's games that certainly stand out. And I think they're games that when you're playing at home um, in, in Ballantrubber or Clogher in particular that, you know, I remember especially big conic matches there that we played there or even All-Ireland semi-finals that we won there. They're the, they're the games that you want to play in front of your home crowd and in front of family and friends. How did you deal with the pressure that was on you all the time to perform at a level, at such a high level? I don't know if I dealt with how if I had dealt with it at all. Uh, you try and deal with it. Um, I don't know if you see it as pressure. For me, the biggest thing is that if I'm prepared going into a game, or in no matter what what the sport is, the same over here. If I know I've trained fully, like I I'm not one that misses training at all. Um, at all, I'd have to literally have a broken leg not to be able to train. Um, yeah. So if I know I'm fully prepared, if I've trained as hard as I can and done everything, and you know slept it if I'm 100% prepared then I don't ever feel pressure to pre- I'd only feel pressure if I had a niggle or I knew you know I didn't um, have been training well or something like that I suppose um, if I know I've if I'm performed and, and practice at, at, at the highest level then you know I can't do any more so I think it just becomes routine 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 you know practice makes perfect unfortunately you know, people hate to hear that, but it's the truth. The more you, the harder you train, the more rewards you get. You know, I think that's been my mantra, anyways. And yeah, as I said, you know, I don't, I don't miss training, and, and that was the same with Mayo, same with Carnicon. You know, just yeah, once you're 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 training hard and and you're performing, I I think that pressure goes away. There is pressure moments in games, but I I just felt that the the more pressure, the more you grow, and and the more you probably want to stand up and and take it on. So yeah. You, it's not that you don't feel pressure, but um, I think you just take it all in your stride. And if you're prepared, then it'll it, it normally it'll, it'll it'll go the right way. You probably don't know any different anyway, Cora, because there's pressure on you since you were a teenager. <laughs> yeah, that that be it. Like I like define pressure. What is pressure? I really don't know what it is. Is it yeah, taking a free kick to win a game and or standing up in the big moments, but that's expected of you all the time anyway. So yeah, like 
I, I've spent my career, in, especially in Gaelic football, being double marked or treble marked. So I think it becomes the norm. You're dead right. It probably just becomes the norm. And yeah, that's that's what it is then. How did you feel about, you know, those kind of games where you were double marked and treble marked? Uh, I think it took me a while to realise, like, to mature that, you know, um, at times, yeah, you can be frustrated. I think I was frustrated when I was younger. And I think as you get older, then you, you realise and, and you're more mature and you realise, well, this is a good thing. If I'm double marked to someone free and we can use this to advantages of the team. I think it probably took me a while to realise that. Um, and maybe that's where the pressure thing might come in, that you're under pressure because, you know, if if you don't have one five, one six, one ten, whatever it might be after your name on, on, on in the newspaper or, you know, on the score sheet, then people are like, oh, she didn't have a good game. But you might have had a very good game and you kicked three points. So mm-hmm. I think it took me, took me time to realise that. And when I realised that, then I obviously could use being double marked or triple marked to, to the team's advantage. But again, that just comes with maturity. Um, and yeah, I suppose that probably took, it took my time early days with Mayo when, when we were winning all Ireland. And yeah, I probably t- took a good coach when Timber Egan was our manager at the time to, to get me to realise that. And he was very clever. He used to move, switch me around spots. He used to play me wing forward. He'd be playing midfield for one league. So he, yeah, he, he was very clever in that he helped me in some ways probably take the pressure off me a little bit by, by moving me around position. What's been your greatest success? Uh, my greatest success is that, yeah, I suppose my longevity in, in my career um, is probably the greatest success. I don't have any, you know, individual um, achievement where I say that's the, that's the ultimate goal. Um, the ultimate goal is that I, you know, was able to play um, a number of sports over a very long time. And from that, I have m- made unbelievable connections um, with with coaches, players, I have unbelievable friendships, whether they're in Ireland or here in Australia or across the world. Um, some of them friendships now are with, you know, rivals. And, you know, I I think that's the big, big success is that you've, you've um, played a, a multi, multiple number of sports um, over a long time. But from that, you've, you've made a, a huge amount of um, connections and relationships that will be there for the rest of your life. And, yeah, and you've had some massive memories over over the time, whether it's five years here in Australia or it's, you know, climbing the Hogan stand with, with me or, you know, winning all Ireland's with Carnacon. They're all very special. I, I never like to pick out any because they're they're all very special. And the, the most special one is always the last one you win anyway. So, yeah, <laughs> that's good. What's going to be your legacy, do you think? Oh, God, that's a good question. Um I just that uh, yeah, I, I I presume it'll be that I, I I lasted a long time in the game. Anyway, I wasn't sure that'd be one of it. Um, I'd say that I was very driven, very competitive um, athlete. That that's that strove to um, to be at the top of a game for a very long time. Um, but I suppose the legacy that I just want to leave is, is 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 to probably my niece and nephews that you know the harder you work, the more you get rewarded. And you know I I, I look at them now. You know I've. I've 13 or 14 nieces and nephews that look up to you and, you know, I just want them to see the hard work and, and, and will get you um, many your places and, and hopefully reward you and um, the enjoyment that you can get out of playing sport, um, that can never be underestimated. I think that's the, the biggest thing that sport gives you so much enjoyment and, and gives you so many so many friendships and, you know, I, as I said, I'm, I'm pushing them in, into every team of sport and you know, I don't want them to be the best of it, but I just want them to have um, you know good friendships and, and and enjoy it for sure and work hard. So, what's next for you then, Cora? Yeah, that's a good. That's the million dollar question. Um, yeah, I, I go I go home from Australia, obviously um, next week, the end of next week, um, and then yeah, I I go back and obviously play a bit of club football, and yeah, I'll probably have to make a decision whether I'll come back. Um, to play another season here in Australia um, that decision will have to be probably made at the end of the month um, so yeah that's probably it I like to probably go home and make that decision because sometimes I feel you're in a bubble over here and it's very easy to make a decision but then you go home and you're like life is very different so yeah it's it's yeah, it's yeah, to go home um, next week play a little bit of club football and, and yeah make a decision one way or the other um, yeah, to come back or not or not come back I feel like I ask you this like all the time, but 
Any is Mayo done now? Like, is there when I'm looking at you in Australia and I'm like, like you're just going so well. Like, there's not a bother on you. Like, you've so much to offer. Is that finished now for you? No, that that's yeah, that ship that ship is. I can tell you that's one day that I'm trying to give you. That ship is long long sailed. Yeah, that's God. I'm retired from Mayo now. What do we do now? Um, yeah, no, God. Um, yeah, it's it's be, it's probably. It's just too difficult to, to try and, and even now the way the seasons are, um, yeah, no, you know, Mayo or Mayo are, are flying at the moment, and you know they've, you know they've a lot of underage talent, and for me, yeah, no, it's it's certainly done. Yeah, tipping away playing a little bit of club football is is is, is the height of it for me now, and um, yeah, I'm sure they're already on to me when I get home to to, to go back in and play, and you know it's where I'm at the stage now. We're playing um, Memorial League with our county players, so. Jesus, I struggled to try and play that last year. I think it was the first year I had to play it, and you're you're we're we're, we're low on numbers, and I'm getting thrown to centre back and midfield and every other position, and I'm like, oh god, Jesus, I don't know if this is for me. But um, yeah, no, I I tip away at club football. I had what 24 years playing Mayo football. God, if some people wouldn't wouldn't have half that. So um, no, certainly I can tell you that's that's a definite no um, no Mayo football. But yeah, I'll be I'll I'll certainly be supporting them. I'll probably be asking this question again now in another year, but sure, look, I'll just pause this answer. But Corey, thanks so much for joining me. I think I can safely say we will never see, well, I will never see a player like you. Um, you just had the most amazing career. You impacted so many people, inspired so many generations, and you're still doing it. So thanks for all of the memories. And um, I'm sure you're going to make an awful lot more as well over the next few years. So thank you very much. And thanks for joining me. And thanks everybody for watching and listening. Please like, subscribe and leave a review.